Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to uh, have you all and uh, uh, both on Zoom as well as, as far as I know, on Facebook Live. And of course, uh, as we do with all of our price talks, uh, ultimately on our university channel and uh, allowing uh, many, many people to uh, experience this with us, ultimately. Um, We've had a great uh, spring season. Uh, I know that's as odd to say in light of the circumstances in which we were, but at the Price School, we were able to uh, use that time very productively and reaching out thousands of, of people um, or for the people that we serve as a public policy school um, and a very, very productive uh, time that we've spent. Again, good morning. My name is Frank Zaruni, and I'm a member of the full-time faculty at the Sol Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. Today, I have with me two very dear friends and longtime friends, um, people who are known to our communities uh, of certainly elected communities of mayors and council members whom we have in the audience today in various platforms. Uh, as well as I'm sure we'll watch us uh, after the fact just as well. But uh, two names that are really uh, so well known in the state of California uh, are of course my dear friends, our former treasurer, Kathleen Brown, and of course, my, one of my mentors and dear friend, Michael Roos. Uh, Mike, uh, of course, uh, serve in the state assembly as a legislator. Uh, and we'll dive into some of his accomplishments in just a minute, but their bios are on our website. Feel free to look at them. I'm not going to read them, but I'd certainly say to you that uh, both of them have been dear friends for a very long time. Kathleen and I have worked on projects as well, and I'm sure I'll get to it during this conversation. And Mike, uh, uh, what can I say about Mike? I've known Mike since I was a first year law student. I'm going to age myself now. Uh, that was when I was 22 years old. Uh, that was in 1982 when uh, my, my, one of my mentors, Wally Carabian, who was very good friends with Mike, uh, invited me to lunches at this wonderful restaurant on Wilshire. And little did I know that I was about to meet two giants of the political world, Mike Roos and, and uh, Willie Brown. Uh, it was amazing time for me to learn from these great giants. Uh, as I was a young law student, uh, and, and I have never forgotten those days, and I'm so delighted that I've stayed friends with, with Mike and, and that he's joined us today. So I want to segue into the first question to Mike and, and start him up with uh, something that he did in the state of California, which was very important to local governments. Um, as many know, as controversial that it may be, Proposition 13 in 1978 became law and part of our constitution in California and certainly benefited a bunch of Californians, but of course uh, also created some uh, inequities, so to speak, especially in communities that were not so blessed with affluency and did not have a huge property tax base. Mike then went to work and, and created something that was genius, certainly, because California's constitutional law uh, did not allow that much room. So Mike, I wanna start with that and tell the audience how you went about to the Proposition 13 and try to help communities good and, and less affluent uh, in the state of California because that particular law bears your name. Everyone knows Melo Roos and ladies and gentlemen, here is the Roos. <laughs> well, it's good to be with all of you, and particularly you, Frank, even though I am impressed when you say, I'm going to tell a story that ages you. What do you think it does to me, <laughs> first and foremost? Secondly, I wanted to tell the assembly, the assembled crowd, that if they think we're here to talk about James Bond or Barry Bonds, they're in the wrong forum. <laughs> These are municipal bonds. And I'll give a quick uh, primer. Uh, uh, my dear friend uh, and icon in California, 
and certainly in the financial services business, Kathleen Brown. Uh, her brother happened to have been governor the first time when Proposition 13 occurred. And it was cataclysmic. It just turned everything on its head. And let me give you the minute example that shows why the necessity of ultimately developing and having signed into law uh, the Melarus Community Facilities Act. If in fact you lived in California prior to 1978, virtually anywhere in California, and you knew a developer that was gonna do 100 housing units, once that track map was approved, the city, the jurisdiction in which the homes were gonna be built would basically call up the county assessor and say, look, we need, uh, we need to develop uh, some sewers and uh, water connections and street lights and curbs and a variety of other things that they would hold the, the developer harmless in, develop, in developing on his balance sheet or her balance sheet and the city would basically take that over, advise the county assessor, and all of us would have our property taxes raised by a minuscule, almost missed amount in order to pay for the new addition to our community. Howard Jarvis and Proposition 13 stopped that in the tracks because that basically was a tax increase to everyone in that community and Proposition 13 basically said, you had to attain that, any kind of increase, by a two thirds vote. So, like government is supposed to work, uh, the governor had uh, his, his group of people who were thinking about it. I was really very embedded in the housing area at that time, so I was thinking about it. Um, the Senate had its little task force. And unfortunately, everyone kept getting back to the same conclusion. What we really do need is a benefit assessment. That means whoever benefits from these improvements must pay for them. Well, that was just fine and dandy until you went to the Republicans and the Republicans said, are you kidding me? We all supported Proposition 13. We need a two-third vote. And of course, every time you got to a supermajority vote, you knew that most of these were gonna be shut down immediately after the vote because two-thirds is just virtually impossible to attain. And then the one thing I can say, and I think Kathleen would absolutely agree, as would Frank and anyone who's been in the political process, is that good policy usually is the combination of good politics. The politics required was we needed to get Republicans and Republicans were anxious to be gotten because most of these new development, developed areas were areas which they had the majority of citizen and votes. Northern San Diego County, Orange County, uh, rural areas right outside of Sacramento County. So Republicans were anxious to vote for something that would restart development in the state, but again needed the two-third fig leaf. And the genius of Melarus, when it gets down to its brass tacks, was that land that was being acquired by the developers usually was in the hands of three or four typically agricultural landowners. So what did we do? We said, let's have a two vote solution. In other words, at the first level where there were three, and by the way, motivated landowners who wanted to sell, let's have a vote there to see if they would like, if they would approve the development of a Melarus district, a community facilities district, i.e. a benefit assessment district, and that would take a two-thirds vote. Well, guess what? Most of those votes are 100% votes, if not 90% votes at the very minimum. So 
that solved the political problem. And then when it went to the local agency, the city council or the county board of supervisors, they could approve the Melarus district by a majority vote and issue debt in order to accomplish the specified goal for which the district was, uh, was created. And by the way, it could be the full panoply of sewers, street lights, water, fire stations, police stations, uh, freeway overpasses, anything that technically benefits only the people in that area. And uh, one other quick little piece of information I'll give you is, well, why is it called the Mellow Roos Community Facilities Act? Well, before term limits, if a significant piece of new law was developed and created, you had the opportunity of what they call a tombstone. And as it happened, after I got the bill out of the Senate, I still had the, uh, out of the assembly, I still had the state Senate and the governor's signature to contend with, even though I knew the odds were highly probable, everyone was anxious to see a solution to this problem that had completely stopped land development in its tracks. So I went over to see the local government chairman, Henry Mello, uh, from the Santa Clara area, and uh, Henry knew all about it. And he said, I really like the work you've done, and you can count on me, Mike, to get this right through my committee and take care of it on the floor of the Senate, and we'll both go to Governor Brown and uh, really uh, work him hard to sign it, if in fact he needs to be worked at all. And as I'm leaving, he looked at me and he said, have you ever thought about tombstoning? Well, I was so new in the legislature, I really didn't know what tombstoning meant. And I looked at him and I said, well, it, uh, 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 tell me a little bit more about that, Henry. And he said, well, I was thinking the Mellor Roos Community Facilities Act. Now, mindful of the fact Henry had not lifted one finger <laughs> to the solution to help in any way. And yet he wanted his name first. I looked at him and I said, sounds great to me, Senator. <laughs> and away we went. And, uh, you know, at this stage of my life, a lot of people think it was more descriptive of my personality as opposed to assigning it to the state senator who so boldly and helpfully moved it through the Senate and to the governor's desk. Well, did Mike, I, hard I, time? I, Mike, did you have a hard time getting Jerry to sign it? He hates debt. <laughs> he, he, uh, you're right, Kathleen. He hates death on the one hand, but on the other hand, he knew that this would get California growing again, and that was a supra interest above the fact that we were going to have to issue some debt in order to accomplish it. Well, I've heard this story now for close to 40 years, <laughs> um, and every time I hear it, I just love it. I bring a smile to my face, Mike, for sure. Now, I, I'm going to bring Kathleen in here because when it comes to the implementation piece of this, no one better than Kathleen, um, who has been on the finance side and the delivery side of the community facilities district uh, infrastructures, because the infrastructure itself is the key component of what this accommodates. And ironically, we in the state of California, most people may not know this, Kathleen, but we owe our infrastructure to your father. And then ironically, we owe the loss of redevelopment to your brother. <laughs> So with that kind of a family affair in infrastructure, talk a little bit about the implementation piece of how local governments benefit from the CFD uh, concept in actually bringing to their communities infrastructure and how do we finance those infrastructures? Well, infrastructure is critical to a, a, a civil society and it's critical to the quality of life that families in California enjoy, whether it's the schools or the roads or the water systems. Uh, this is, and my father understood this. My father, you know, 
ate and drank and, and sang infrastructure. And so I was raised uh, um, uh, on a belief in it. He never thought the word was very sexy, but uh, what it delivers is very, very powerful. And the, what Mike did was, was truly um, uh, the best of, of government. You know, there's a problem and government w would rise up and through a bipartisan effort, uh, come up with a very creative and thoughtful solution, which by the way, Mike, has stood the test of time. I mean, here we are, that was what, 1978? Eight. Eight. 1980. Yeah. And, you know, here we are 20, four, you know, 40 years later, and, and still these community financing districts, Mellory Roos bonds are being issued uh, at the local government level to provide the infrastructure for community growth in, in California. Of course, you, you, you know, have to go to the markets, you have to find investors, you have to tell your story, you have to have demonstration that you can pay the, the bonds off. Um, but this has been one of the many really valuable tools. Um, I want to bring it a little bit up to today, to, to the, the conversation, because um, we are living in challenging times, uh, whether it's the wildfires in California or the COVID in our communities um, and the, the um, uh, subsequent uh, economic dislocation. We, we really have a, a situation which is sometimes baffling because you look at the stock market and the stock market seems to be doing, you know, very, very well. Um, that's Wall Street. You look at Main Street and if you drive down my streets here in, in the Westwood area of Los Angeles and one retail shop, restaurant, nail salon, small businesses, the things that fuel our economy, they are boarded up, you know, for lease. So we have this dichotomy and um, the markets uh, and, and, and the economy is really quite challenging. Uh, and right now, people don't want to move quickly. You know, they want to wait for the election. They want a little bit more clarity on um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the COVID situation. Long term, I'm very, very bullish uh, on, the, on the markets. Uh, but we're in kind of a, a, a point, um, an inflection point, if you will. And as, as I look at um, the, the situation that we find ourselves in today, we need all the tools in the toolbox, whether it's mellow roof bonds, whether it's our traditional GOs, whether it's lease revenue, whether it's certificates of participation, um, or public-private partnerships. I think all of them, all of our local officials need to have each one of them. And there's kind of a three-legged stool as, as I see this um, situation that we're in now. It's one leg is budgets, one leg is the markets, and one leg is, is infrastructure to get back uh, and tie this into what you've asked, Frank. And at the first leg of the school, stool, state and local governments, they are under severe stress. And there's kind of a time lag, and particularly in California, um, because the COVID economic fallout has fallen much more uh, um, heavily on the lower end of the economic pole and on, on small businesses. So because our tax base is so heavily driven by high taxpayers because of the reliance on the income tax, actually, we're in tough, tough shape, but not as tough and, and dire as was originally thought. But our budgets are going to have to be balanced. We're not allowed to run a deficit at the state and local uh, uh, level. So governments are going to have to cut expenses or cut services. They're going to have to increase revenues and raise taxes, uh, or they're going to have to borrow and not deficit financing isn't really permitted at the state and local uh, level. So we are going to need uh, more direct federal aid. It's absolutely mandatory when they come up with the next uh, relief bill. And I understand they're uh, uh, Pelosi and uh, Mnuchin are, are negotiating. It's critical uh, that it has support for state and local uh, governments. So we need that direct aid. And, and timing matters. I mean, I hope they can do something before the election, uh, but certainly thereafter. The second leg is the markets. And the market structure it, it is fragile. I mean, it, it, yes, it's good and markets are open, uh, all of that. 
but um, markets are fragile things. I, I've seen it in, in um, my experience in finance and when I was treasurer and I did IOUs uh, because we had the state uh, fiscal uh, financial crisis. It can turn, uh, you know, in a minute, liquidity can dry up. Uh, and, and frankly, one thing I worry about is issuance volume, whether it's from infrastructure or whether it's deficit financing, they could, they could overwhelm uh, the market. Um, we need the federal backstop. The um, Fed has been very creative with the MFL, the Municipal Liquidity Facility, which has been very good, but it's only for short-term debt, hasn't been used much. Uh, I would hope that they would find a way to have uh, it be more analogous to the corporate debt backstop and be there for longer term. That will really help uh, with access uh, to liquidity in the markets. And then um, uh, the final leg, it, to come to your question about infrastructure. It can be, without a doubt, the engine for long-term growth. But we have to think about it differently. There's old infrastructure, and then there's the new infrastructure. And the old infrastructures are roads or schools, et cetera. But the new infrastructure is broadband. We've seen with COVID where we don't have connectivity for kids in schools and poorer neighborhoods. Uh, we need it to run our businesses. And so broadband has to be a, it has to be ubiquitous and it has to be like a utility. Um, and then um, the great thing about infrastructure is it generates both near-term job creation and long-term productivity uh, gains. It has a multiplier effect and uh, is so much better, frankly, than other stimuluses that might be out there. But what we need, um, frankly, are some long-term funding sources. We need a lot of innovation and we need some relief on the permitting side to get things through. And uh, frankly, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in public-private partnerships to be put in that toolkit um, and uh, that local and state governments should have them as a tool. So that's kind of my response to the infrastructure question. Well, I'm going to come back on the public-private partnerships uh, issue, Kathleen, because you and I worked on a very significant project uh, in the state of California, it still is the largest uh, of its kind. But I want to go back to something that M uh, Mike said earlier uh, and focus on what is not happening at the federal level uh, and, and perhaps shine a little bit of light on how this can be negotiated. Mike earlier said uh, the days that he was there, the collegiality and because I knew on both sides of Governor Dick Majin, for example, who happens to have been a Republican, was also a mentor of mine. I've learned so much from him, but yet his respect for the other side was humongous as much as uh, Mike's respect for Republicans was also very much. Today, unfortunately, that's not there. And one of the issues perhaps we can, I should throw to both of you, Pelosi and Mnuchin seems to me negotiating in the very politically charged context, as opposed to bringing it down to the level of more of a public administration and a negotiation point of view of talking about what has worked in the past, like build America bonds, for example, or matching grants. I mean, when you talk about that, I want you to both to kind of reflect on what we've done in the past and how we've helped local governments before and why we have this gridlock right now because everything is so political and everything is being reduced to that political context. Mike, let me start with you and then Kathleen. Well, I'm better at the past than the present because it, it really is a comparison of different eras. I have my own hypotheses about what changed uh, but I will say this, uh, again, in, in bringing up George Duke Majin's name, uh, went to his memorial service uh, because of such deep respect and heard reminded uh, to the audience, this is a man who signed the first South African sanctions bill in the world and secondly signed uh, the Roberti Roos Weapons Control Act, which was the first and I think still only last remaining law that outlaws and bans 
uh, the mere possession of 65 different assault weapons uh, in this state. Uh, so you talk about cooperation. Uh, Dave Roberti and I knew, just as Maxine Waters knew, that the other side was just beating up on George Duke Majin like he's never experienced. And yet he saw that there was a greater reason. There was a more purposeful outcome in signing both of those. I, I just, it, it's hard to even think of the t context we're in now and refer back to that. I think Mnuchin has become the negotiator because I believe he's probably the fairest broker, you know, out of that White House and has developed some level of trust with Nancy Pelosi and obviously, uh, not obviously, but uh, six to five, uh, the Senate is going to go along with Mnuchin if, in fact, he says that the president approves of what uh, he has uh, negotiated with Pelosi. And I think all of us yearn for a day uh, when we really are more thoughtful as opposed to just making assertions, thoughtful in conversation and dialogue uh, as uh, a common friend we have in common once observed, he said, talking is the cheapest thing that we do with the most valuable possible outcome. And when you think about it, there is so little talk, at least more and more I'm observing in the circles I run, how once again, people just make assertions. They don't invite you into a conversation by basically saying, do you see it that way? Or where do, where do you think uh, my analysis may be faulty. I, I think that's the environment that you, Kathleen, me, so many who were in and out of government, uh, but really cared about the quality of their government at every level, uh, beginning with the local level uh, to the state and ultimately fed. You know, that's, that's what we saw, that's what we experienced, and that's what we fought for. We fought for those kinds of alliances on the other side of the aisle where you could have just a great conversation and come out of it, you know, with something that was in the middle, but moved us ahead. And, uh, you know, again, I, I'm not sure what the, uh, what the solution is, but I think that it's in certainly the administration's interest to try to get a package out prior to the election. And I think that uh, uh, Pelosi as leader feels a responsibility to help people who are absolutely on the ropes and have not been attended to now for the last three weeks and are struggling to try, you know, to keep their home, to keep their families together, to keep their sanity. Kathleen, how, how then can this negotiation, as I was asking earlier, mm -hmm. can focus on really implementable pieces? In other words, like I mentioned, um, We've done this before, amazing policies like the GI Bill, for example, unrelated to the issue, but build America bonds or matching grants, et cetera. So why aren't we seeing this and why is it so political that we cannot benefit local governments, which I think everybody understands it's important. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm looking at the uh, banner behind you, the USC Price School, named after Saul Price. Saul was a great friend. He was a um, tremendous businessman, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. And I used to go down and see him and, uh, and have lunch with him or dinner with him in San Diego, whenever I was in San Diego. And I went down to visit him once. He was 96 years old. And I'd pick him up. He goes, you're late. You're late. And we go off to lunch and trod down the street. And he's ahead of me. I'm keeping up with him. We sit down. And the first thing he says to me, he was upset with the Democrats and something they'd done in Congress. He was a lifelong Democrat, friend of my dad's. And he said, well, Kathleen, is it time for us? Democrats to take over the Republican Party and infiltrate them. And I thought, you know, that's that's the answer to your question is that the that the extremes of our 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 politics have really become the norm. And that's not America. 
that is not, it's not even, even as liberal as California is, it's not California. And I think the media plays a role in this. I think the media loves the fight. And so they inject steroids into um, the divisions. And then that's like catnip, to use another analogy, to, you know, those in politics wanting to get their headlines. And now we've got social media, which magnifies everything um, to a fairly well. And um, it, it really requires um, reflection, you know, calm and const constructive um, uh, civic engagement and, and people, you know, speaking up um, and, and, and driving for, for results. And I actually think that infrastructure and a crisis um, are, are, are good vehicles to help bring people together. I used to say when, when I was um, uh, at Goldman Sachs uh, and, and pitching ideas to, to my clients, many of whom might be on the phone from municipal government or state government, my favorite client was a desperate visionary. And if you had Mike, Mike is the, the visionary with, with his uh, um, great legislative accomplishments, but in a time of crisis, which we are in today. Uh, I mean, you, you just, the, the, the stock markets don't tell the story of the, the men and women and the families that are so hit by this virus and the, the um, resulting economic dislocation. And that crisis can provide an opportunity for people to come together. And infrastructure has historically been one of the few vehicles that allows people from the left and the right to um, uh, come together around a thoughtful program. And, and I think that um, the chances for an infrastructure uh, bill um, are, are strong, though I thought that, you know, when, when in the, even after the last election, but it, it got derailed by a, a lot of the acrimony and, and other issues that, that you uh, describe. Um, and that infrastructure bill has got to uh, have um, all the tools, it should have all the tools in it, whether it is uh, Build America bonds, which were so effective in the last recession, uh, helping governments uh, finance uh, their obligations, whether it's incentives um, for public-private partnerships, because they can be an effective tool. They're not you know, the solution for everything, but they can provide a lift for very, very important projects, whether it's, um, you know, matching grants and whether it's incentives um, around the, the new infrastructure like broadband, uh, for example. The, um, uh, the bill that was passed, uh, um, TARP, after the last recession, which we survived and got through and, and were prospering until COVID hit. Um, but it was very uh, powerful in its incentives uh, in the healthcare space, where if you recall, they provided uh, funding for electronic records. And that has revolutionized the delivery uh, of healthcare for those institutions that were able to take a, a part of it. They also gave big incentives for um, um, uh, energy projects and renewable energies. And while there was one or two, you know, bad apples in the, in the uh, multi-billion dollar program, it offered tremendous um, uh, investment uh, around the renewable space, which was now a key part of our uh, energy mix. So infrastructure can be part of the solution of bringing these uh, diverse, divergent voices together. Yeah. Uh, for, before I get back, I'm going to come back to you again, Kathleen, because I, it's a nice segue to talk a little bit about public-private partnerships, and then I'm going to go back to Mike about the, the bond market and, and, and the bonds uh, aspect of this. But um, I want to remind our audience that if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat room, and we'll get to them after uh, our conversation here in about, uh, we'll end in about 20 minutes or so, and then focus on your questions. So feel free to ask your questions uh, on the chat, and, and we'll look forward to uh, getting to them. Um, in the meantime, I want to come back to you, Kathleen, because you and I worked on a very large project, in fact, the largest of its kind in the state of California. 
in actually um, convincing the state of California to look at an alternative methodology uh, in building a courthouse in the state, which happens to be, to my extreme satisfaction, uh, named after uh, one of my favorite people in the state of California and, and one of my dear mentors and friend, uh, Governor Dick Majin, uh, today in the city of Long Beach. Um, and, and you were there at the time with Goldman Sachs. I remember several of our meetings and with uh, various players, et cetera. Um, talk a little bit about the availability of public-private partnerships. And you said it well. I mean, I wrote it in my book chapter about um, on the topic uh, that this is not a, a silver bullet. It's not a magic bullet. It's not appropriate for every single project. But talk a little bit about that particular vehicle or methodology, so to speak, to deliver that infrastructure that we're talking about. Great. Well, first of all, public-private partnerships are as old as America and old as, as, as in infrastructure's creation. The original red cars in Los Angeles, which was a public transit system, were created by the private sector. The same with toll roads. And even without a public-private partnership procurement uh, methodology, the private sector is your partner in building you know, the roads. You might do it with geo bonds. This is just a different uh, procurement method. And the value of it is, number one, there are literally not billions, but trillions of dollars in the private sector in infrastructure funds looking for sound investments. Not investments that return, you know, 15, 20%, but kind of steady eddy returns like a utility, for example. And um, it's a, it's a funding mechanism. You have to have a source uh, you know, of revenue to, to pay uh, for the public-private partnership. So it's not some sort of black box or, or magic bullet. But what it can do, one, it can expedite delivery um, uh, of a procurement method. Uh, we, when I was at Goldman, we um, uh, worked uh, in Chicago and Indiana on the tollways, which were monetized. Now, that was a what's called a brownfield, where you're, you're monetizing an existing public asset, taking that revenue and putting it into something else. The governor of Indiana took the revenue from the sale of the tollway and put it into a 10-year capital program for all of his transportation needs. But Greenfield, um, uh, which would be new development of new infrastructure, I think is much more politically um, uh, uh, saleable, if you will, and, and palatable. And that's where you have a new road, uh, where you have a new courthouse, where you have a, a new uh, um, water system, whatever it might be. And you can um, utilize the private sector to put the upfront equity into the project uh, so that you, you can get it um, front loaded and, and jump started. You can also take advantage with a public private partnership of all the innovation in the marketplace. The typical um, uh, process for building infrastructure and financing it is a bid um, design uh, and then bid, uh, design and then build and then you go through that sequence again. When you're doing a public-private partnership, um, you're working hand in glove uh, between the owner and the developer and the um, engineers and they're, they're taking advantage of all the innovations uh, in the marketplace. So it is a, a very effective tool um, with social infrastructure like the courthouse. They're more like a lease revenue bond. And, and then you have to measure value for money and which one is more effective, a tax exempt uh, financing or a P3. And the final thing I'd like to say about public private partnerships is you build in the terms of your um, transaction. And one of the things government doesn't do well is maintenance. And I'll watch city state when they're having to cut the budgets to meet um, balanced budget uh, deadlines, they're going to be cutting the maintenance budgets. And that ends up, you know, hurting us. Um, uh, the deferred maintenance needs in the state are astronomical. When you do a P3, the um, partner is in for 30 years 
or 20 years, however long the partnership is, and you have them build in the life cycle costs. And that may cost a little more. It's why when you do the value for money, you have to do an apples to apples comparison. But that locks in the, um, uh, the, the maintenance uh, that is so critical when you're investing in infrastructure and you build in performance payments. And if they aren't performing, the government doesn't have to pay until they fix the elevator or get the road you know, cleared. So I think that they are an important tool. They're tricky. Um, uh, polit more, the financing part of it is a lot clearer than the political part. But as Mike knows, that's generally the case. <laughs> the politics are tough. So uh, thank you for that, uh, Kathleen. And, and I tell my students, and when I talk about public-private partnerships to them, that um, the, the beauty of, of what you've just said is that the life cycle cost is that um, there is a direct economic tie to the maintenance uh, of a government building rather than not, right? So that economic tie, and I always say to my students, let me bet with you that 30 years down the road, the Long Beach Courthouse is going to still look like a class A building rather than a class C, class D by the time it gets to that time with other uh, courthouses that we unfortunately have and we know where they are. I mean, I practice law, you and I both practice law in some of them where the escalators were breaking, you got stuck in the elevator, etc. That is not going to happen with the Long Beach Courthouse because there's a direct economic incentive for the ownership to be able to deliver um, on that promise. Mike, I wanna come back to you because I wanna talk a little bit about the bond aspect of this. Um, we at Price, we're very lucky to have amazing um, uh, supporters of our executive education program uh, for the last eight years. And one of those supporters has been Stifel, of course, and both of you are somewhat associated with the organization. Kathleen, you sit on the board of directors. Uh, and and uh, Mike, uh, you certainly have been a director at Stifel and, and have worked on the bond uh, side or bond delivery side of this because of your uh, certainly background and, and understanding how these uh, um, community facilities district, which are funded by bonds, uh, work. So talk a little bit about today's bond market and talk a little bit about, you know, what kind of deals you're looking at. I think there was about $90 billion worth of, of bonds uh, uh, this year uh, out there. And, and, and of course, your organization is responsible for quite a few of that. So talk a little bit about today's bond market, Mike. Well, thanks. Uh, but you reminded me, Frank, you know, I thought the most clever billboard ever in gubernatorial electoral history was when George Duke Majan decided to run. And of course, on the billboard, they'd have D-U-K-E hyphen M-A-Y Jin, G-I-N, George Duke Majan. And so everybody knew ultimately who, how to say his name. So we are Stiefel. And in fact, we go to great lengths because somebody will want to call us Stiefel, or God knows what. But we are Stiefel. And what I am proud to say about the organization where Kathleen is a governor, even though her full-time work is at the Manat Law Firm, uh, and I am a, a senior banker uh, at Stiefel, uh, we do more issues in this state literally by 30% more than our competitors. Clearly, our sweet spot are education bonds, our sweet spot are community facilities debt, uh, our sweet spot increasingly are pension obligation bonds. Uh, we do everything under the sun, and we do it well. Uh, my mentor uh, over there is a man by the name of Raul Amesqua, uh, who uh, cut his teeth at first Boston and then he truly made the De La Rosa Company uh, the premier uh, minority-owned financial services firm in the state, acquired by Stiefel, and thankfully we got Raul. Uh, but he continues to dazzle me uh, in terms of his imaginative and creative 
thoughts uh, with how to finance things that are uppermost in local government's minds. The bond market is extremely robust. Interest rates are in historic low. In fact, in August, they were comparable to what they were in World War II. Just unheard of. Now they're about 25 basis points higher, uh, but still a great environment. Coupled with the fact that you have the baby boomer, boomers who are even though the stock market is, is doing well, everybody is waiting for a big correction uh, for a variety of reasons, mainly the unemployment numbers, the, uh, the bankruptcies of small and medium-sized business. Uh, uh, you can go on and on in terms of the severe impact of COVID. Uh, but uh, as a consequence, baby boomers are looking for less risk-averse uh, places to put their money. Uh, the bond market is the number one uh, target, particularly when you get into uh, tax-exempt uh, uh, issues. Uh, so everything really bodes well. Uh, as Kathleen mentioned, you know, the Fed decided, uh, I think, around April to go into the secondary market and buy munis. That has been uh, very, very strong in terms of keeping the demand high. And the outlook is good because the need increases with each and every day, once again, as Kathleen has well described. Well, uh, uh, thank you for that. And, and uh, maybe, uh, uh, Kathleen, I can come back to you and, and, and uh, um, uh, dive a little bit more about where we are in terms of COVID. And of course, we're going to be at a day, it's going to be post-COVID. I mean, let's face it, I mean, We've had viruses galore over humanity. And, and, and as far as I know, we've only eradicated one and we live with the rest of them. So my guess is we're gonna live with COVID the rest of our lives and the rest of humanity's time. Uh, it's just that things are gonna change, et cetera. But how do you see this marketplace, both from an infrastructure building and bond uh, uh, going forward a post-COVID marketplace? Well, I think, I, I think it's a little fragile right now, a little bit more, more I'm a little bit more bearish than, 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 than Mike on the, the, the market. Um, but post-COVID, and there will be, as you said, a, a post-COVID market, uh, I am quite bullish because um, the, the municipal market, uh, both in the tax exempt and the taxable market, as you, you noted, we've seen $90 billion of ta municipal taxable bonds uh, in, in this year alone. And they are performing very, very well vis-a-vis -vis, uh, comparable uh, corporate bonds. But this market um, will be, will be re robust. And I think that given the, the infrastructure needs, we're, we're a very big game in town. Uh, you know, I, I talked about the new infrastructure and the old infrastructure. Uh, I mentioned broadband as, as one of the areas, and I saw a question on, um, on the chat, what, what are some of the other um, uh, kinds of infrastructure? Resiliency. I, I think resiliency bonds, um, uh, when we see the wildfires that are happening in California, when we see the hurricanes in other parts of the country, when we see sea level rise, um, I think local governments are gonna have to think about their infrastructure in different ways. And here's a very unusual um, new kind of uh, infrastructure, testing. If we are gonna open up uh, our markets and open up our businesses, we people have to feel safe and the first thing that uh, you know i do not understand why we haven't solved this testing problem in america it's being done in countries all over the world uh, much more effectively than here but when we can get the testing down cheaply and quickly i mean you can't take a test and wait five days that's ridiculous uh, you could have the disease in those five days unless you strictly quarantine but testing is to my mind an essential service to, to operate our business. And at least for the next five years, uh, there's gonna be a COVID two and a COVID three, there's gonna be, or maybe there'll be more pandemics. So I have talked to people about 
uh, testing as an essential service and um, government, it, best if it's done at the state, but frankly, a county like LA uh, County could do it, taking the, the, the bull by the horns and giving the confidence and the certainty to the labs and to the manufacturers who produce the swabs and the vials and then the labs that do the testing uh, and the people around that, that whole uh, cycle of activities it needs to be defined and identified, and then you could finance that through an availability payment kind of model, where you, you would give some certainty, and then the private sector would step up and, and produce the materials that they need, and the labs make available the lab space. And then, in, in there are many different kinds of tests now that are being developed uh, that are quicker and cheaper, uh, but for government to fund that through a, um, uh, an availability payment kind of model and pay it back through the federal funds that would come, like the CARES Act money, um, and also on, on the economic growth, because the, the, the shutdown of the economy has such a negative effect on, on our GDP that if you can open up the economy, um, the government paying for the the testing and getting it uh, safe so people can come back or more than pay for it. Brilliant. You've heard it here, folks. <laughs> the availability and the bonds to finance uh, the, uh, the testing. I think that's brilliant, Kathleen. I think that, uh, you know, you're right. I mean, the ramification of, of testing, um, I think is- If we were in the legislature, that would be done. I agree. I was about to go there, but that's why I was going to go back to Mike and saying, Mike, we need your kind of, you know, personality and, and congenial character to be able to bring this all together here. But from the, the bond uh, perspective here, what other, uh, uh, what other, as, as Kathleen mentioned, uh, one, certainly a, a brilliant one, what other sectors do you see or or new infrastructure possibilities do you see uh, uh, Stiefel to be involved in, for example? Well, I'm not gonna answer that because I have, Kathleen is all blue sky. That's been her attractiveness <laughs> for <laughs> decades and continues to be. Uh, I have a dark cloud that I wanted to talk about. Uh -oh. And that we will be, we, uh, local government uh, will be limited uh, if they don't do something to stem the growth of pension obligation. And this is a dark limiting factor uh, on the horizon for all of California. And, uh, you know, again, it's one of those moments when you wish you had the authority uh, to be part of a thought group uh, to uh, see, you know, what are the viable ways of getting this under control. Uh, but it is growing exponentially, and it continues to edge out essential services uh, in a local government's budget. And it's just a fair warning uh, that the people that are elected really cannot put their head in the sand on this issue because it will limit our ability to fund all of the positive, progressive, uh, helpful things that uh, Kathleen just spoke about. Uh, you have to go there, Mike, huh? So on the, the pension stuff. <laughs> oh well, man, I can talk about yeah. this topic for hours, but, but you know, you, 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 of course you make a very good point and part of our, as much as from a health and a post-COVID perspective, our testing is going to drive some of what we do in local governments as well as the finance world. But certainly, I, I appreciate you bring that up, Mike, because uh, I am a firm believer of, of uh, uh, making sure that uh, all governments uh, fund this. Um, and and you know, in my case, in my city, for example, uh, we're lucky enough to be among the top cities uh, in the state to have over 80% or 85% of our um, uh, uh, obligation on pensions funded already. So not many cities can say what I can say in my city, um, which is a shame, but, but then again, you know, that's part of, 
part and parcel of all of the challenges that we face, I guess, um, and, and certainly we're gonna continue to face. Recently, we did a program with a couple of my um, uh, brethren in, in law to talk about the potential financial crises that local governments can face and will face. And some of our cities are in the brink of bankruptcy as a result thereof. Um, and, and that's the dark cloud that you're speaking of. Um, and perhaps Kathleen, I can go back to you if there's any, any last minute thoughts about potential <laughs> solutions to that issue, because you've been involved um, as the chief financial officer of the state uh, it, it's not new. I mean, it's been around for the longest time, but, you know, is there any uh, magic bullets or, or anything that you have uh, that you can share with us about, you know, that aspect of it? And from your perspective, especially at Goldman Sachs, how does the financial market look at that issue when you're looking, when they're looking at financing bonds for a local government? Well, certainly uh, the rating agencies and investors do look at uh, unfunded liabilities. Um, so pension obligation bonds, also um, other post-employment uh, benefits, the health care obligations of local governments, those are all factored in to what a state or local government's ratings uh, will be. And it's also factors in on what kind of pricing uh, that they'll have to deal with uh, when, when and they go into the to the capital markets. Frankly, you know, environmental issues are now uh, a very big risk factor. And you have uh, BlackRock, you have um, other investment uh, firms, uh, as well as rating agencies, uh, calling into question the resiliency factor um, of a places like California because of, of wildfires. And that's going to affect the cost of borrowing and the access uh, uh, to markets. Um, you know, I think that, that with respect to, to the pensions, uh, there were some big reforms that were adopted by the legislature and, and the governor um, uh, eight years ago or so uh, when, when Jerry was governor and they just uh, were, they were challenged. Um, those reforms, they went up to the California Supreme Court, the Supreme Court upheld uh, those reforms so they stay in place. And I think, you know, over the long term and pension obligations are long term, they're not today, they're the longer term uh, obligation. That that is going to help flatten uh, the curve, and there's probably more, you know, that that can can be done. Um, this is a this is a memory lane issue, but I was on the Los Angeles Board of Education when Prop 13 passed, and we had no money. Um, you know, Mike was coming up with his Mellow Roost bonds, but Jerry was taking the money from the state and sending it out. But it was a very difficult time. And in our negotiations with the teachers, guess what was cheap? Health care. So we gave a lot of the health care benefits that today, you know, are the big expense. So what you, you try and fix a solution today and it comes back to, to bite you. 35 years uh, later. But um, I think Stiefel is great in the, in the bond market. They have some very um, creative solutions around pension obligation bond, which at today's interest rates can, be, you know, you, again, you have to do the analysis, but it, that is like refinancing your house. If you have an expected obligation of 8% in the interest rates today or 2% or 3%, you, it makes sense to refinance. It doesn't always work, though. I mean, you're, you're, you have uh, um, uh, some challenges there, and you have to be very, very um, strict and, and conservative about how you, you manage those obligations. But uh, firms like Stiefel are excellent at, um, at helping you think through and do the analysis to see if something like that uh, can make good sense. Uh, thank you for that. And I'm going to come back to that. Our time is technically up for this portion of, of the conversation. I encourage everyone to put their questions in the chat box, but I am going to continue engaging our guests uh, until such time I see questions, of course. But uh, uh, regardless, uh, because I, these, these are amazing people, I want to use every second of it productively. But uh, I encourage folks to uh, put their questions uh, in the chat box and I'll definitely ask them of, of, of our uh, 
guest. But I want to go back to what you said, Kathleen, and, and, uh, uh, and reemphasize the point that absolutely the bond market, especially with the, uh, um, the money being so cheap, uh, especially for those local governments with very low debt ratios, um, be able to borrow at a very low percentage to pay off. Um, if we did that in, in Rolling Hills Estates, for example, for our site fund. Um, we borrowed, I think, uh, we, we made about 4% on, on all of that transaction, saving our taxpayers in the city several hundred thousand dollars over the span of, of 10 years. And, and good times came to the city. We even, uh, it was a 10 year borrowing, we paid it off all even early, uh, even made more money as a result. So there is that opportunity certainly for local governments to be able to go out to the bond market and, and look for uh, amazing deals to be able to retire more expensive debt, which in CalPERS numbers, you're looking at seven plus percent nowadays um, in interest rates, whereas in the bond market, I bet you you'll be able to find in the threes and, and at the rate or, or so. Mike, uh, uh, any comment on that? No, I think you summed it. You know, Frank, another um, thought, uh, given your, your focus on the low interest rate environment that we're in today, are something called century bonds. Century bonds are 100-year bonds. Typically, a general obligation bond is around 30 years, can be shorter, can be longer, with a lot of call options and, and so forth. But um, major universities around, around the country and other institutions uh, in the last 10 years or so, given low interest rates, have, have, have borrowed um, uh, in, in the, the capital markets uh, for 100 years and, and, and use that, that debt um, in very smart ways to uh, fund uh, long-term uh, facilities. They're taxable. They'll do that in the taxable market because there isn't you know, a tax-exempt uh, uh, um, uh, qualified uh, program. But um, institutions with great names uh, that are going to be around and California is going to be around for a long, long time. So uh, that's another tool that um, I know some of the um, uh, investment banks uh, uh, were looking at with clients and particularly universities. Uh, that, that's interesting, certainly. And that's something uh, um, to look into. Uh, any other uh, um, actually tools that uh, Mike or, or Kathleen you can think of for our, especially for our uh, folks on the line and, and people who are going to watch us after the fact um, mayors and council members that, uh, that you can perhaps uh, give guidance to, or city managers for that matter, uh, that we have a great deal of them uh, uh, watching us and, and, and at the same time uh, will watch us um, right after the program. Yeah, just, uh, just one going back to what I know best, and that's Mellow Roos. Once again, it was designed to in everyone's imagination, solve a specific problem of new development in the state of California and how you put in place uh, infrastructure. Uh, the law has been expanded mightily uh, to continue to add things that are legitimate reasons for financing or creating and financing a Melarus district. What I begin, what I've begun to see that is provocative is you had one high rise building in San Francisco that used Mellow Roos to get some benefits for the tenants that could not be obtained by the uh, city. So they did it through that mechanism. You had a trolley that is yet to be developed, but was put forth to the people who would benefit by that trolley, the landowners, and they approved it by a two-third vote. So in other words, I guess my instruction is that in, a, in certain cities, it may well set up to look at Melarus as a financing tool by challenging the voters affected by the benefit uh, to vote by a two-third landowner vote 
uh, to approve the development of the district. Uh, indeed, and, and, and today, of course, uh, uh, there are several pieces of legislation uh, that Governor Brown, in fact, uh, had signed uh, in order to help local governments as a result of, of course, terminating the redevelopment agency concept in form of EIFDs or IFDs, infrastructure finance districts, which kind of uh, follows the concept, uh, uh, Mike, uh, that, that you came up with years and years ago uh, and kind of expands uh, the possibility of, of uh, you know, uh, how you create them, et cetera. Any comments on, on that part, Kathleen? No, I, I'm, I'm more familiar with the um, Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District that kind of came into being uh, when I was still in public finance. I'm, I'm out of the public finance uh, market, more into um, you know, government and regulatory work now at Manette, but uh, certainly uh, see through my work as a board member, uh, director at Stiefel, um, the kind of great work that they are doing in the uh, financial markets with these kinds of uh, uh, infrastructure financing tools. Uh, I am construing the, the fact that I'm not seeing any questions uh, that we're answering every question there is to be answered on the subject matter. So I'm gonna continue the conversation uh, in any event because we, we still have a little bit of time left, but um, I kind of wanna go maybe uh, to talk about some of the newer uh, technologies, so to speak, and especially COVID opened up a brand new uh, world out there on which platform we are right now. Uh, the Zoom and the Teams and, uh, and whatever else platforms that are out there, but they're all facilitated by a robust uh, broadband uh, technology and, and a broadband, so to speak, availability. Um, uh, any experience in, in, in uh, that topic uh, uh, at all, uh, Kathleen or Mike, and, and, and how you see that developing in the future? I, I, do, I don't, uh, Frank. I just, I know certain cities uh, around the country have um, uh, done broadband and uh, invested, made it into a municipal utility function. I know that there's been private uh, capital uh, invested in, in, in broadband, but I think we're at a point where with COVID, we've seen a forcing function of moving us um, uh, into a, a much greater utilization of, of technology through Zoom and, and the like. Um, I don't think we'll ever go back to businesses spending the money that they have on travel and conferences. Uh, they will come back, but not to the degree that they were. I think this this vehicle is going to be um, very, very much uh, used. And I think that the broadband investment, therefore, is going to be more ubiquitous, both uh, by the private sector, but I think the public sector has a real um, stake in this so that we ha don't have an, uh, an equity gap um, in terms of social justice. It's uh, it's a frightening thing and it and adds to what we we're talking about in the divisions in our society. If we want people to come together. You have to have um, uh, a level of um, participation. And um, so the investments are very important. Uh, as we come to, uh, to a close, what I uh, uh, wanted to, first of all, say that uh, um, all of these issues, of course, uh, from a policy standpoint, are being addressed at various levels of government. Uh, this morning, for example, I was in my policy committee at SCAG and we were listening to a presentation about uh, uh, use of space, um, how that's going to change. And uh, uh, one of uh, major uh, real estate think tanks uh, like organization was presenting to us in about their research about how space is gonna change and. And, and you know, the space requirements is gonna change, even though their research shows that most people prefer to go back to work in infrastructures rather than working from home, although that percentage is going to increase, but the structure of the workspace is going to change. Uh, we're gonna probably uh, have more of a, uh, 
a less of an intensity on space, putting people together as opposed to separating more on the real estate side. Um, Mike, any uh, parting thoughts, anything that as we conclude uh, um, uh, 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 here? Well, a big thank you because there is no greater stimulator of civic conversation and serious dialogue than you, Frank. <laughs> and anytime I'm invited, I just thoroughly enjoy it. But I do believe we're always at a nexus. And I am fascinated by what's going on today because it reminds me that essentially we are social animals. Uh, we really like the idea, uh, if I'm going to do business with you, this, is, this may be a beginning, but ultimately I want to see you over lunch. I want to hear about your family. I want to hear about what really concerns you well beyond uh, the specificities of the deal itself. Uh, and you can't build trust over Zoom. And that is always going to be an essential human characteristic and requirement. Uh, but things are going to happen. I uh, am very involved uh, with Southern California Leadership Council that has 37 CEOs from the six county Southern California region. And to a person, they say that 20, 30 percent of their workforce have grown very comfortable working out of home. They haven't seen one loss in their metrics of organizational effectiveness. And so that's going to change. I think what's also going to change is that uh, certainly a lot of retail outlets are in bankruptcy. They're never going to be heard from again. This is going to be opportunities to convert that space into living space, in my opinion, uh, because we have a tremendous affordability problem uh, with our housing in California. And that is the first step in leading to a brain drain that California can never afford. So those are just some parting thoughts, uh, along with the idea uh, that for local government, uh, the greatest way uh, to realize the future is through municipal financing and bonds. And uh, it's exciting having been an elected official uh, to now be uh, in this position of continuing to work with local government in being able to connect their dreams with a reality. Kathleen, uh, parting words? Just thank you, Frank, for uh, bringing us together around <clears throat> this Zoom campfire to talk about the, uh, the current state of affairs of public finance and, and infrastructure. It's been very stimulating. Thank you. Well, uh, I want to thank you both on behalf of uh, University of Southern California, particularly uh, your friend, Sol Price's uh, namesake school of public policy, which happens to be one of the best public policy schools in the nation. Um, on behalf of our dean, uh, Dana Goldman, uh, as well as our entire faculty, I thank you for joining us. It's very, very important that we bring people like you to our constituency um, and discuss these things. As Mike said, it's all about, you know, the experiences uh, that we all have had, perhaps in guiding in possibly policy going forward. Um, as Mike alluded to, perhaps uh, in our world, uh, things would have been different. Maybe we would have negotiated differently, but we hope that uh, in today's world, some of this relationship and trust that Mike mentioned, and I wrote an entire negotiation book, on that particular topic of collaboration and uh, uh, relationship and trust that we must forge in order to be able to do this. We have, I wanna mention before we leave, upcoming events just like this one uh, as part of our executive education uh, uh, offering, so to speak. Uh, the next one coming up is uh, with Phil Washington, uh, the CEO of Metro and my own colleague, my dear friend, Marlon Bournette, uh, uh, a, a foremost scholar on transportation economics um, that's going to come up uh, next. Then we have also um, uh, my colleague Don Mesmanian, who uh, Dan was uh, our former dean also at the Price School uh, when it was called SPPD, School of Public Policy, Planning and Development. Um, and Dan and, and uh, Susan Robinson from Waste Management are going to talk about 
the importance of waste as a policy matter as opposed to just waste and on in the context of sustainability and how that plays in into uh, 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 the role. And then uh, last, but uh, in, in this conversation, we also have my colleague Antonio Bento um, actually uh, uh, mixed in and, and, uh, uh, and having a conversation um, just like this one with uh, Drew Murphy of uh, Southern California Ed Edison um, or uh, uh, Edison International actually, I'm sorry, um, uh, talking about sustainability and resiliency, of course, um, in the electrification subject matter, uh, which is also going to be extremely important. And last but not least, we're gonna culminate the fall series in the City Manager Summit in November. And we're hoping for um, a, uh, 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 a very big name as our speaker, but uh, uh, we'll announce that uh, the minute we hear uh, from, uh, uh, from our speaker. Uh, but it'll be uh, very interesting uh, nevertheless, as this one has been. And again, thank you very much. Uh, we'll put this out on our university channel and, and uh, of course many will watch us and, and hopefully learn something here and there. Um, again, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Kathleen. It's great to see you both. And I'm gonna conclude uh, this uh, uh, session uh, with uh, my thanks to our staff as well, who do such a great job in organizing and bringing all this together. Um, and uh, again, thank you, and we'll look forward to seeing you in uh, future dates in our executive education program.